All right, we'll get started. Hello, um, welcome to the Ethel Brown Harvey uh, postdoctoral seminar series. My name is Maria Salih, and I'm a postdoc at Stanford University, and I'll be moderating today with Muhammad uh, Shimshek, a postdoc at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. We are excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Miguel Salinas Saavedra from National University of Ireland, Galway, and Sudha Rajdurkar from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory will share their research. Each speaker will be given a 20 minute window uh, talk followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please enter your questions into the Zoom Q&A box. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Miguel Salinas Saavedra. After obtaining his bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Chile, Miguel joined the lab of Dr. Mark Martingale at the University of Hawaii, where he pursued his PhD in zoology, studying the molecular mechanisms of cell polarity establishment and how they evolved in early branching metazoans. After his, uh, after his postdoc, er, after completing his PhD, uh, Miguel joined Dr. Uri Frank at the National University of Ireland Galway uh, for his postdoc, where he's been investigating dedifferentiation and reprogramming of cnidarian stem cells. Miguel has a truly impressive award and publication list, and one I'll highlight is that he has been awarded a prestigious long-term fellowship last year from the Human Frontier Science Program. In addition, he's active in several scientific societies, including this one, our favorite, um, and he's also very active in community outreach and in teaching. And I hope you all are as excited as I am to hear his talk on mechanisms of cellular reprogramming in Nidarian whole body regeneration. Miguel, take it away. Thank you first for giving me the opportunity to present my talk. And I will start saying that I'm interested in how cell is specified. And for that, I'm also studying regeneration. And I will start saying in general terms that regeneration is the regrowth of missing parts, where here I just picture it in a leopard gecko that's lost its cell and regrowing after a few weeks. So in the lab, we don't use leopard gecko. Instead, we use the Hydratinia symbiotic carpus, that is a colonial cnidarian. It consists in adult polyp. Here is the feeding polyp and sexual polyp. We have different colonies with separate sexes that release the sperm and eggs to the water, has external fertilization, the embryonic development that lasts for one day from this larvae, the metamorphose from its primary polyp and from the colony again, completing the life cycle. So this animal has all these characteristics that make it a good model organism to study development and regeneration. And Uri Frank's lab has been studying this process in decapitated polyps for a long time, where decapitated animals can regrow a full head with tentacles within two and three days. So this process is carried out by stem cells that we call eye cells. These stem cells are migratory cells that are located in the lower part of the body and upon amputation of the head, they migrate from the blastema and regenerate a full head. So in the lab, we identify these stem cells using the market PV1, either by in situ or immunostaining, that also correspond to the zone of proliferation that is restricted to the lower part of the body where these stem cells are located. And as you can see here, there are no stem cells in the head of the polyp. So for a long time, we thought since the head cannot, do not have stem cells, they cannot regenerate. And therefore, these animals do not have whole body regeneration. But the thing that we have found recently is that that's not true. And amputated hypostome that do not have stem cells can regenerate a full polyp. So the hypostome, hypostome is this zone here in the oral most deep part of the animal. So what I do, I amputate the hypostome. And if I incubate this tissue without stem cell under certain condition, the, after two weeks, the hypostome will regenerate a full polyp. So the tissue go from different morphological changes elongate from what we call the stolon here, from the tentacle buds, and then we have a fully functional polyp with the stem cells. So what I will present you today is the study that I've been doing, identifying the cellular mechanisms during the first six days. And the only thing that you have to remember from this picture is that we start from a tissue without a stem cell, this hypostome, and then regenerate a fully polyp with the stem cells. 
So the question is, where do these eye cells come from? Or where do these new stem cells come from? From vertebrates, actually, or from other studies in other organism, organism, we know that the stem cells can differentiate in different cell types. And we know now today that also different cell types can de-differentiate to stem cells. So from vertebrate, vertebrate studies, we know that senescent cells are present sometimes in culture or in the tissue that can go to two pathways. One, a transient exposure of senescence and a chronic exposure of senescence. When there is a transient exposure of senescence, this tissue go to plasticity and reprogramming and regeneration. And when it's a chronic exposure, um, the tissue go to aging. So we think, and we have been studying this pathway where the transient exposure of senescence, and we think that this might be the mechanism. So I will present you now the work. And one of the things that we'll start saying, first of all, define cellular senescence as a cell cycle arrest state where cells cannot divide, but they're still viable. And this can happen by multiple factors as I show you here in this cartoon. And one of the markers that are most used to identify cellular senescence is the senescence associated beta galactosidase. Here I show you amputated apostome that you can see the this marker beta galactosidase is present at the site of injury in all these hypostomes. And therefore we think that this is the beginning of the process of the differentiation. So our working hypothesis is that upon injury, there is the formation of a senescent cell that's released this SASP, that is the senescent associated secretory phenotype. The SASP is sensed by other cells type. And when this is, is sensed by these cell types upon the, re uh, the release or the disappearance of the nascent cells, these cells might become a new stem cells. So the question is, senescence the key factor for the differentiation? Um, I will start showing you the time lapse of them between day one and day three. So as I told you before, at day one, there is a, a staining of beta galactosidase at the site of injury. We have another senescence marker that is CDKA1 or P21 that is also upregulated at the site of injury. Between day one and day two, another senescence marker, gamma H2X, is also present in the hypostome. And then this marker by day two uh, migrates or are located in the gastrodermis and in the, the epidermis, but and the intensity is also lower than the first day. And by day three, the signal is basically gone and only few signal in the gastrodermis is present in the tissue. Then by day three to day six, there is a re-entry of the cell cycle. The senescence period finishes and the, the, we labeled with DDU the, 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 um, the proliferative cells between day three and day four. However, we still don't see any increase in PV1 staining that we use to label stem cells. But by day five and day six, there is a decrease in the signal of EDU and an increase in PV1 antibody. And then by day six, you can see these new stem cells labeled with PV1. So here I just do a zoom in. And just to show that PV1 signal appears six days after amputation in this side of the tissue, as you can see here. So a summary of this timeline, is we have a peak of senescence marker, beta galactosidase and CDKA1. We also have another senescence marker, gamma H2X, and this period finishes at three days. And therefore we call this phase signaling phase, where it's a short period of cellular senescence. Between day three and day four, there is a re-entry of the size cycle that I show you with the EDU positive staining. And then by day six, we already observe secondary eye cells labeled with PV1 antibody. So all this process, we call it the growing and the differentiation phase. And then after these days, there is an elongation, elongation of the stolon and the body column. There is tentacle formation of tentacle buds and the formation of the full body. And we call this phase differentiation pattern and outgrowth phase. But today I will just tell you about these two first phases. So we are trying to answer if senescence is the key factor for the differentiation. That's our hypothesis. So for that, we are, I'm using CDK inhibitor one and beta galactosidase as senescent markers, because as I told you before, this marker is upregulated in the site of injury one day post amputation, as well as beta galactosidase that's both localized in the site of injury. So first we were, we wonder what's are the, what is the fate of these cells? And to that I developed a transgenic reporter. Here I show you the in-situ pattern of CDKA1 that is expressed in the body column 
in the tentacles, but mostly absent from the epistle. I develop a GFP membrane the reporter that is driven by the CDKI promoter. And you can see here in the transgene polyp that matches the same pattern of expression where the GFP is in the lower part of the body column in the tentacles and is absent from the ibostome. So as a proof of principle, I amputated the ibostome and I check the GFP. You see at zero dispose amputation, there is no GFP present in the ibostome, but one day post amputation, we see the labeling of the membrane GFP at the site of injury. I also stain this tissue with the beta gal stain, and you see that also is present at the site of injury. And here I show you the merge. This is the cartoon as a reference. And you see that at the site of injury, both markers are present in these cells. So that's indicate that we can use this reporter as a marker for cellular senescence, given the co-distribution with beta galactosidase. And now the thing that I did, I bring this in the spinning disk with help of Kerry Thompson in the university. And we try to track the cells. So I will play this movie where you can see that the ibostome contracts and expel all these cells that I will tell you now that these are also green, uh, even though I don't show it here now. But we know that these cells are expelled from the tissue and we know that senescent cells are expressed from the, expelled from the ibostome. So what I'm showing you now, I, I did the same experiment, but I increased the concentration of the agar. So I embed the tissue in the agar and stain with nuclear staining. And in green, you can see the GFP. So as you can see here, the, all the cells are inside of the ibostome, but they then 32 hours later, here is the silhouette of the tissue. You see that nuclear staining is outside of the tissue and some green stain, some green stain as well. So if I take another snapshot 45 hours later, you see that uh, most of the tissue is green outside. Here is the silhouette of the animal. And here you can see the green cells or the senescent cells outside of this, the tissue, or outside of the ibostome. So with this, we are thinking, or we are concluding that a short period of senescence is terminated by the extrusion of senescent cells. And the senescent cells are no longer in the tissue of, after three days. So we start wondering what happens if you do ex a functional experiment. And for that, I develop a homocycle CRISPR knockout to inhibit cellular senescence. So I knock out CDKI1. Here I show you the wild type, again, the cartoon as a reference, where you can see the beta gal staining one day post amputation in the site of injury. And beside that, I show you the CRISPR knockout, the homocygous, where you can see that this signal of beta galactosidase is not present one day post amputation. So we think that CD, um, we can see that the knockout inhibits cellular senescence. Then we check for reprogramming. Here I show you the PV1 staining. And you can see that um, after six days, we have a strong staining of secondary eye cells or new stem cells in the tissue. And in the knockout, we don't see this staining. So not the CDKI knockout not only inhibits senescence, but also inhibits the reprogramming. And therefore, we check for, for regeneration. And you see 10 days for amputation, the wild type. We have a nice poly with the stolons, with tentacles, and a nicely formed ipostom. But the knockout has deficient ipostom regeneration and no polyp development. And this amorph morphology stay for 10 days and longer, and never form a polyp. So the knockout, the inhibition of cellular senescence also seems to inhibit regeneration and the differentiation of stem cell. The third thing I want to show you and to finish is the gain of function experiment. So the aim of this was to extend the period of cellular senescence and the approach that I took was to use optogenetics to activate RAS since it has been reported to induce cellular senescence. For that, I adapted the optosos construct uh, made by Johnson et al. Actually, I learned this in a SDV meeting a few years ago. And by, um, in the short story, the light input induced the binding of these two components, activating source and activating the RAS pad. So basically the exposure to blue light activate RAS. And the activation of RAS has been reported as an inducer of cellular senescence. So I did this for hydroctinia and developed the transgene. And here I show you the beta gal staining for the wild type and in the, also in the dark condition where beta galactosidase is not present in the epidermis and is present only in few cells since they are already 
leaving the period of the arsenesis, as I showed you before. But if I observe this in the optogenetic to, uh, transgene exposed to 12 hours of blue light, you will see that there is an enhancement of cellular senescence that is not present in control conditions. So knowing that the, the optogenetic might increase the senescence, I check for, the, for six days post amputation, where you can see in the wild type exposed to blue light, there are few uh, eye cells, secondary eye cells, as I showed you before, for similar conditions. But when I check the optogenetic to uh, transgene exposed to blue light, we see that the number is increased largely. And I haven't done the count yet, but you can see the large number of eye cells compared with the white. So as a summary, uh, Adriatinia hypostomes without stem cells are able to regenerate a fully functional animal with the stem cells. There is a transient cellular senescence period that predates the differentiation, and the senescent cells are extruded from the tissue. The inhibition of cellular senescence interferes with the differentiation, and we propose this mechanism as an evolutionary concern mechanism for cellular plasticity in animals, since we, um, there are similar results in vertebrates or in cell culture. And with that, I just will thank the lab, Kerry, for help with the screening this, and all of you for listening and open for questions. All right, that was very, very cool. Um, I have questions, but I'm gonna try to be a, a good moderator and <laughs> let you answer one from the audience first. Mm -hmm. um, Augusto Ortega Granillo says, cool work on your hypostome time course experiments. How long do you pulse with EDU? Uh, is it possible that at later time points when you showed decreased EDU, the cell cycle is longer and proliferation dynamics are more similar to homeostasis? Mm -hmm. So I do uh, 30 minutes uh, pulse of EDU and then I fix immediately. And I have done also a long pulse from incubating it from three to four days. And also you have um, a lot of EDU staining and regarding to the other stages, the thing that happens the, there is no on homogeneous um, cell cycle. So different cells are present in the, it, it, different cells are divided, but there are few, fewer number of cells that are in the cell cycle, basically. And I have done this as the same with the mutants. And actually in the mutant, all of the tissue present EDU after five, six days. So it's, it's something with the regulation of the cell cycle more than the homeostasis of the tissue. I think. Great. Um, we have a question from Lauren Cody, who says, very cool. Do you know what kind of cells undergo senescence? It's a cool question that we are trying to answer with the reporter. And we just know that most of them are epithelial cells, but we don't know if other cells go senescent. Um, we know that after one day, they migrate from the, uh, we have seen them in vivo migrating from the, um, from the epidermis to the gastrodermis, but we don't know what types of, um, I will see if I have, sorry, if it's confusing, but if you see in this picture, for example, the shape of one of them is kind of, I don't know, maybe neuro muscular or maybe just migrating, but to be honest, we don't know yet what is the identity of them. Um, I'm going to cheat and insert one of my questions. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, if instead of just kind of chopping off the head, if you were to leave the head in place but damage it, would you? do you think that you would get the appearance of eye cells uh, around the head or do you think you would only get migration from the base of the polyp up? Yeah, I've I, I done that and you get the normal regeneration. You have to actually, you have to take all the tentacles, you have to isolate properly the hypostome. If you lead, if you leave a, oops, sorry, the light is off. If you leave a, a, a piece of tentacles, if you leave in a, a little piece of tentacle, the tissue will die and don't go to the, the, the differentiation. So you have to have the hypostome isolated. Cool. Um, Augusto has uh, another question for you. Uh, do your optogenetic animals form polyps at some point? Yeah, they, they actually, this one is the optogenetic and this is already a polyp information. If I leave it longer, they form tentacles and very nice form. And the thing that we are seeing now that it is even shorter time than the wild type. So it's one or two days before the wild type that they form the poly. Very cool. That's an awesome experiment. Mm -hmm. um, Sunandan Dar says, very interesting talk. Is anything known about how the senescent cells are extruded? Is it possible to prevent extrusion? 
Um, that's a cool question. Actually, today we were talking about that in the lab meeting, and we don't know how they are ex extruded. We think that they saw so the, the tissue contract, and I will try to show you that in the movie again. The tissue contract, and when they they, they contract, I think that they just increase the, the pressure and they expel. Now, how to avoid this? There is a mechanical way that I can do it, and that's if I increase the concentration of the agar, the tissues, the, the cells stay in the hypostome and never are never expelled. But I never, I have never been tracking them because I've been doing this experiment in the last two weeks. So yeah, but it's a good question that we want to see how they that happen. Cool. So we've got one from Paul Bump who says, hi, Miguel, this is a, uh, this is fantastic and beautiful work. Congratulations, such a cool model. Uh, curious about the expulsion of senescent cells here. Let's see, hold on, sorry, I should have read the, oh, sorry, that's just a repeat. You've got the same question there. <laughs> um, um, the same question as Sunandan asked. Um, and he asks, and similar to Lauren's question, is there something that caused those senescent cells to be targeted for expulsion? That's a good question. And we don't know, we don't know. Um, yeah. And uh, we don't know yet how to answer that question, to be honest. We don't, we have the reporter, we have, the, we are developing the tools and developing more transgenic, but identifying the, what cell types or what's the mechanism that target those cells. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be more difficult that we, we plan it in our head at the beginning, but yeah, it's a good question. Very fair. Um, Pablo Palma asks, um, says super interesting story and tools. What do you think is being secreted by the senescent cells to induce reprogramming? Mm -hmm. Can you isolate them somehow and see what kinds of genes they're expressing? Yeah, so we are going, we have going on a transcriptomic to see if we can identify what is uh, secreted. It has been, there are multiple factors that's called the, this SASP, that is the signaling phenotype or whether that SAS is, has been described in vertebrates and in Nidarians there is no conservation of that, any of those. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one of the thing is to collect them because you can see the, the debris, you can see them in the dish one day post amputation and one idea will be to collect them, but yeah, we have to, I don't know if we, besides beta galactosidase and P21, we don't know if other factors are gonna be conserved with vertebrates. So it's a totally unknown. Okay, um, and I had kind of a related question. Like, mm -hmm. do you think it is that the senescent cells are inducing it? Or like, I'm, I'm thinking of the CDKI1 mm -hmm. knockout that you have. Like, do you think that the importance of CDKI1 is in the senescent cells or do you think it might play uh, other roles, additional roles in the non-senescent cells? Mm -hmm. So uh, the first question is within that. So when the, the intact hypostome, this pattern, you don't, we don't see it. So this pattern of single cells expressing CDKI1 is only after amputation. So we think that the CDKI1 in this context is only present in the senescent cells. Now, what other role might be doing in other cell types? The thing that we observe with the knockout is that, um, as I told you in the beginning, there is no proliferation and no stem cells in the head. So in the knockout, there are higher number of proliferative cells. So the, the inhibition, the knockout of CDKI1, that cell cycle inhibition, activate the cell cycle in places that there's not, there used not to be um, diagnosed cells. But what other roles beside the senescence, we don't know yet. Cool. Um, a question from Lily uh, Wong. How um, heterogeneous is the cell composition of the hypostome? Which cells de-differentiate? That's a good question. Um, it's one of the things that we want to answer. And uh, yeah, um, and for that, I, I did one of the strategies that I did, I developed a transgene of using PV1 that promoter, that is the, um, that will stay in stem cells. And this we associated with the membrane GFP and with a fast timer protein. So this means like the recently differentiated cell is gonna be green, the isers, and then the, the progeny is red. And you can see the, the, we can identify the empty spaces where the isers are and the progeny. So they, we are trying to use this transgenic to identify in the hypostome what cell types become secondary isers. And that's the far as we can know. And also we are using the transcriptomic to see if we can have a clue what type of cells become secondary isers. So far we know that our cells that were not dividing before, 
So far, we know that using the transgenic that are cells that were inbred before, so they are not the stem cells. That's the only thing that we know from so far. Cool. Um, I had a question. I was wondering, peewee, is that an argonaut protein? And yes, I think so. It's in the, in the it's an, it's anti-transposone. I'm not familiar, to be honest, but yeah, it's, it's in the, it's a, in this part, in that power, I think. Okay, so do you think that small yeah. RNAs are likely to play an import, important role? Yeah, yeah actually, oh. when we send the, sorry, when we, when we send the, the tissue for um, transcriptomic, there was a huge, large amount of microRNA that we, did have, we didn't know what's doing there, but during the senescent period, there is a large amount of microRNA, and there are literature that suggests also microRNA are in a role in, in senescence. Very cool. Um, let's see. Uh, Timothy Dubuque says, mm -hmm. does the senescent activity need wound healing? What happens when you stimulate your blue light animals in the absence of injury? That's a good question. Um, so when I stimulate the, I will start for the second question, when I stimulate the optogenetic or in absence of the injury, they basically don't do anything. They act normally, but if I cut the head and I stimulate the blue light, the body, they have a, a slower regeneration. And if the tissue do not wound heal, and that's, I've done the experiment when I put so early the tissue in agarose, so I, I mechanically, I avoid the wound healing. The senescence period also do not form. The interesting thing uh, is that sometimes the tissue, the iposome fuse, and when they fuse, if they fuse by the senescent, by the injury site, they won't heal. And the part that won't heal has the senescence, but the part that fuse doesn't have the senescence. So since I don't have a direct answer, but it seems to be that they won't heal, it might be important for the senescence. Okay, cool. We've got uh, two more questions from mm -hmm. Anne Corsi. If you make a second cut to the amputated hypostome, do you still get full regeneration? Um, yeah, and these are 200 microns, so I haven't adventured yet to do it, but I want to do it. And actually, it's, it's something that I, I have tried to do, so, but I don't have an answer for that. Fair enough. Um, okay, and, and last one from Augusto um, Ortega Granillo. Uh, what about senescence in the stump where you have pre existing eye cells? Do you see senescence at the site of injury, or do you observe cells far away from the injury mm -hmm. entering senescence? Yeah, so. I will go back to the transgene. Sorry for the scrolling. Yeah. So this is the how the normal poly, polyp looks like. This is the zone where the eye cells are located. And I tried to do an staining of the GFP and the peewee. And so far, I haven't seen co-staining. What I've seen, for example, here there might be a peewee stain, and beside that a senescent cell. So it's something kind of a conversation between senescence uh, or or non-cycling cells and stem cells in the lower part. Um, when I cut and I deform the blastema, I have never seen senescence, but that is because the gastrodermis is full of beta, beta galactosidase. So the signal of the gastrodermis then is very hard to distinguish if the blastema has or not has the senescence. So that part I don't know. Okay, so um, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to continue uh, popping them into the Q&A and Miguel will be able to type responses as he can. Um, but I think we're ready to go ahead and pass it off to moderator number two, Mohamed. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, thank you, Miguel, for the perfect, fantastic talk. So our next speaker is Dr. Sudha Rajdarkar. Uh, Sudha Rajdarkar started her professional career as a dental surgeon in India. Her interests in the basic science led her to the States to pursue a PhD at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Sudha completed her PhD in Dr. Vesa Kartinen's developmental biology lab, where she studied the role of TRIM33 in heart development using mouse model. During her PhD work, Sudha won STB Meeting Travel Awards and other prestigious awards and scholarships. In 2016, she joined the Mammalian Functional Genomics Group, led by Len Pinacchio, Axel Wiesel, and Diana Dickel at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as a postdoctoral fellow. 
Suda is an advocate of STEM initiatives, particularly inclusion and diversity in the biomedical workforce. Today, she will present from her postdoctoral research conducted at Berkeley Lab, investigating the functional relevance of topologically associated domain TAD boundaries. Suda, please. Thank you, Mohammed, for uh, that kind introduction. I'll get started. All right. Uh, so just to reiterate, uh, I'm interested in understanding the functions of the non-coding genome uh, in the context of its three-dimensional organization. Uh, I'm going to begin by giving a uh, brief introduction to this topic. So this is a commonly used illustration uh, that gives a very good idea of how the eukaryotic genome is packaged inside of the nucleus. And in the context of my talk today, it deals with this particular layer, which is the sub megabase scale of genome organization. Now, if we think about our DNA as, say, uh, you know, to be uh, in the nucleus as spools of yarn or wool, and think of the DNA strands as they slide inside of the cohesin motor complex dynamically until they are met with CTCF molecules in convergent orientation. That is where this machinery stalls momentarily. And if at this point we were to measure the contacts between these self-interacting domains, we get, um, you know, uh, in assays such as chromatin conformation and high C, we get what is a contact frequency matrix. This is defined as a topologically associating domain. So each of these, um, and within this, the corner domains show the highest contact frequency. The boundary here is where we see abrupt uh, changes in upstream versus downstream contacts. And this, the, the TADs themselves um, are a layer of the hierarchical genome organization in that they define chromatin neighborhoods such that regulatory sequences like enhancers can interact with their target gene promoters within uh, their own TADs, whereas interactions that spill across over from the boundary into the neighboring TAD are avoided. Now, um, it's well known that proteins such as CTCF and the cohesin complex are enriched at TAD boundaries. However, there's also uh, factors such as how keeping genes and RNA polymerase too. The constitutional loss of CTCF and uh, other proteins is not compatible with survival. Also, it is well known that both CTCF mediated mechanisms as well as those uh, governed by transcription are responsible for formation as well as functioning of the TADs. However, none of them have been shown to be uh, you know, sufficient or universally required. I have to also mention that, uh, you know, a few years ago when uh, this field was emerging, it was thought that TADs are very well conserved across closely associated species as well as cell types. However, from the papers that have been coming uh, and reports coming out recently, we know that even based on variables such as experimental conditions and the differences in the bioinformatic algorithms, that is the TAD colors, there can be minor differences, especially within the TADs itself um, when you compare cell types and species. And then the boundary is shown to be relatively stable. From anecdotal reports in vivo in literature, we know that disruption or rearrangement of the genomic architecture in the form of deletions, inversions, and duplications results in phenotype that mimic human disease. However, whether it is the genomic features within these larger spans or the CTCF molecules sitting at the boundaries 
that underlie these phenotypes has been an outstanding question in the field. We took an unbiased approach to this question and asked this in the mouse. And we're also interested in understanding if this was at all a common feature of uh, the mammalian genome. We started by looking at over 3,000 annotated TAD boundaries and scored them for enrichment of CTCF as well as cohesin. We factored in um, gene expression for developmentally important genes in the flanking TADs. And together, this analysis encompasses more than 200 ENCODE datasets. One of the important features of this experimental designs is that no genes should overlap the TAD boundary that we choose to delete. In our final uh, design, we have eight independent TAD boundary deletions in the mouse. I'm going to use the schema for the next couple of slides. And on the left here are shown the TAD boundaries that we have deleted, numbered from one through eight. Next are the respective uh, uh, developmental genes in the five prime TAD and the three prime TAD. Uh, flanking this column here that shows the actual boundary deletion. And as you can see, they range between 11 and 80 kilobases um, in span. And they also delete varying number of CTCF clusters. We assessed each of our TAD boundary deletion knockouts um, comprehensively for survival, uh, for physiological and pathological parameters, and also looked at molecular phenotyping aspects such as changes in the TAD architecture as well as gene expression. On the plot here on the right, uh, what you see are Mendelian frequencies of the TAD boundary knockouts, and uh, they're compared with over 400 knockouts curated in the publicly available IMPC database. As you can appreciate, the TAD boundary B1 between SMAT3 and SPAT6 is lethal. The one um, B2 between TBX5 and LHX5 is subviable. While boundaries B3 to B5 seem to be in the viable range um, in this comparison, we see statistically significant changes in their survival um, uh, prenatally. For the other three line, uh, lines, B6 through B8, uh, TAD boundary deletions, uh, there seem to be no um, changes in survival as compared to wild types. For the TAD boundary deletion between SMAT3 and SMAT6, uh, we do not obtain any homozygous uh, animals beyond embryonic stage 8.5. For the boundary knockout between TBX5 and LHX5 um, within the lungs, and this is the wild type, and um, for the knockouts, we see a vestigial left lung phenotype. Concordant to this phenotype, we see about 40% reduction of TBX5 in the lung tissue. Uh, I want to mention that we see no such changes uh, in gene expression of TBX5 in the heart. And uh, this is uh, for people who are uh, familiar with the field, TBX5 is an important and obvious candidate gene in heart development. Uh, this is also confirmed by in situ expression data uh, over here, where you see reduction in TBX5 in the left lung in the knockout as compared to its wild type litimate. This phenotype is also consistent with a lung specific loss of function of TBX5 that has been previously described. When we look at the high C data, uh, for this locus. And um, I'm showing you here the wild type uh, site. This vertical line denotes the boundary between the two flanking tads, which are clearly delineated here. 
In the knockout, when this about 21 kV uh, is deleted, we see that these interactions spill over across the boundary in what is called as uh, you know, merging of the neighboring TADs. And this is better appreciated in this contact matrix that shows the net loss or gain um, of interactions. Uh, another way of looking at it is to look at the insulation profile. So the way to understand this is the deeper um, the valley here that denotes better insulation. So when you compare the uh, wild type, which is shown in the black line here with the knockout, this seems to be uh, the loss of insulation. Um, similarly, when we look at the directionality index, and this is the wild type where we see very clear and abrupt changes between the upstream and downstream contacts, no such differences are observed in the knockout, um, clearly showing that there is indeed disruption of that uh, boundary causing interactions uh, across the TATs. Similar merging of TADs were also, was also observed in two other loci, um, TAD, for, TAD boundary deletion B3 and B6. For this deletion between twist one and the AHR gene, we also see gene expression changes, in particular down regulation of few genes that seem to be a little further out from our TAD boundary deletion. Now, we haven't followed um, uh, you know, phenotypic uh, assessment in the later postnatal stages, but uh, we cannot rule out um, those effects, you know, late age onset effects, especially uh, with genes such as MIOX2, whose haploinsufficiency is associated with age-related axonal degeneration that is reminiscent of glaucoma-like effects in humans. This is a busy slide, and I do not intend for you to uh, read uh, each of this in detail. The point I want to make is I showed you merging uh, of the neighboring and fl or flanking TADs for three loci. And then if you look closely at four other um, loci that we have assessed, they all show either reduced or loss of interactions uh, within the greater span of the TAD or at the boundary itself. So in summary, uh, out of the seven um, deletion loci uh, that we assessed, we see changes in the genomic architecture, the 3D architecture for six lines. Um, we see associated gene expression changes um, for two of those loci. Now this does not rule out um, you know, any gene expression changes for the stages uh, and tissues that we have not uh, examined in this particular study. There's also survival or viability associated phenotypes for five out of the eight loci, with one of them also showing a clear uh, developmental lung defect. I want to mention here uh, that uh, we do observe that uh, the number of CTCF clusters that are deleted correlate with the severity of uh, the phenotype that we observe. And this is also consistent with a recent report uh, in ESLs um, from the Bingren lab, where they showed that the strength of insulation of the TAD boundary is directly proportional to the number of CTCF clusters in tandem at the TAD boundary itself. When we compare the deleted boundary to data from human copy number variants, we see that none of the human deletions in databases such as the NOMAD fully span TAD boundary loci that are, uh, in, uh, that are in the study. And that is true for uh, seven out of eight loci when we drop the overlap constraint to about 50%. This is also cons con consistent with data from Katie Pollard's lab, um, which showed that there is a depletion of uh, structural variants at CTCF sites uh, at the TAD boundaries in apes, as well as non-diseased human populations. 
Um, I've shown you data that uh, supports that TAT boundaries are indeed commonly required for normal genome function. TAD boundary disruption may be sufficient to cause human disease phenotypes, and these genomic features should be carefully assessed in clinical genetics screenings. Now, although I've shown you that the TAD boundaries are und undoubtedly uh, you know, functionally required, um, some of the questions pertaining to the molecular mechanisms that might underlie that functional requirement still exist. And so um, just looking at one of these um, loci in more detail, this is the TAD boundary that was deleted uh, and it is in the vicinity of TBX5, which shows a lung phenotype. When I looked at this locus carefully and pulled uh, ENCODE regulation data that is publicly available in the UCSC browser, um, I noticed a predicted uh, enhancer, uh, which has, you know, very specific enhancer signatures in the lung tissue, as you can appreciate from the H3K27 acetylation, which is a hallmark of enhancer, um, you know, predicted enhancers, and also open chromatin. When we tested this in our in vivo transgenic pipeline, um, this enhancer drives uh, expression in the lungs uh, uh, of the reporter gene LAGZ at all the stages we have examined. So then is this, you know, one off example or are there more in the genome like that? So I looked at uh, over 1800 uniquely, um, unique elements that are validated and curated in our Vista Enhancer uh, browser and asked the question, how close are each of those to the closest TAD boundary? And so it turns out that um, for these uh, curated uh, uh, Vista elements, um, the median distance uh, to TAD boundary is about 200 kilobases. Out of all those, uh, around 275 mapped between zero and 500 kb uh, to the closest boundary. And so some of these, uh, and these are five kb bins, um, seem to be in the immediate vicinity of the TAD boundaries. And it would be interesting to investigate these loci for similar deleterious or phenotypic effects. Also, a recent report that investigated the regulatory landscape of the TWIST1 gene, um, they deleted uh, either enhancers or CTCF sites um, for the TWIST1 gene, uh, but these are all located in the coding sequence of the HDAC9 gene. And when they delete either the enhancers or the CTCFs, there is a downregulation of TWIST1 gene and there are also uh, associated phenotypes such as um, deviation in the skull size as well as polydactyly. And these are consistent with phenotypes that would otherwise be observed in a twist one heterozygote knockout. Um, going forwards, uh, I um, and the community uh, is interested in you know, teasing out more details of these specific loci, whether the effects that we see are, or the mechanisms that we see are CTCF dependent or independent. Uh, and then another in, uh, aspect that uh, I would like to understand is what is the cell type uh, specificity of some of these uh, changes that we see. Um, and then there is also, a need and evolving interest in, you know, what, what is it that you precisely define a TAD boundary? And of course, what can we learn from human disease encompassing cohesinopathies or enhanceropathies? With that, I'd like to thank my lab and also acknowledge my mentors, in particular Len Pinacchio and Axel Wiesel, who I've worked with closely. Um, I have tried to indicate in bold all the people that directly contributed to this work. Uh, I want to thank our funding sources at NIH and also the Society for Developmental Biology for giving me the opportunity to present my latest work. And with that, I'm uh, open to any questions you might have. Thank you.
Thank you, Sudha, for the really beautiful talk. Um, I'll start with the audience questions. Uh, first one is from uh, Fabri Marsa. Uh, nice work. Do you plan to do H3K27 acetylation chipsick or other histone modification on these deletion B1 to 8 experiment to check any enhancers reassignment? Yeah, that's um, something that uh, I am interested in following up uh, uh, eventually. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is from Sean Abrams. Uh, cool talk in the B2 deletion, what is protective in the right lung to allow for normal development of this lung compartment since it appears there isn't asymmetric activity specifically in the left lung? Um, I don't have uh, data to, uh, you know, uh, answer that question directly. Uh, it is also something that I want to follow up and understand. Um, so uh, I'm generating knockouts for the enhancer uh, and the CTCF uh, for that deletion. And then hopefully, you know, we can compare uh, across the three different knockouts in that locus uh, and understand what is going on. All right, thank you. Uh, I will have a question uh, going ahead from the lung question. Actually, that was like the second one was also one of my questions. Uh, the, the thing in my mind is you said in heart, you don't see any phenotype, although TBX5 is known to be functional, right? For heart development. Mm -hmm. Is there any known literature about like the levels of TBX5 being different, like required levels for lung versus heart development? Um, I'm, I cannot uh, answer uh, for the heart, uh, but for the lung, definitely uh, there is, you know, um, about a f uh, like a 50% reduction will result in those kind of phenotypes that has been shown before. There was a lung specific knockout that uh, characterized so that. In lung, lower levels are shown to be resulting. Sensitive, in yes, yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. Uh, one more question I had is like the genes, certain genes you target, like like the SMADs or the MAP kinases, uh, more than their like exact levels, their phosphorylated levels are basically important for signaling pathways, right? So uh, like, what do you think causes those like phenotypes you observe uh, if the total levels are not drastically changing? Like how does it affect the pathway? Um, so, um, because you mentioned the MAP uh, uh, 2K5, you know, so the MAP 2K5 gene actually, uh, when you knock out um, it, those uh, animals will die, they're embryonic lethals due to heart defects. Um, and what I suspect is that is our uh, longest span of TAD boundary deletion. Uh, I suspect that we are either hitting multiple uh, enhancers for the MAP 2K5 gene. That's that's my hypothesis, and it is something that we will uh, you know follow uh, up on. Uh, I, I will do it uh, you know uh, at least from uh, uh, as I go uh, ahead. Um, uh, that that's um, my um, best educated guess for now. Uh, one more question I have is uh, uh, sorry, I, I just want. To yeah, sure. Oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to add. Yeah, the reason I think that is also because uh, the SMAT three and the SMAT six, those um, are not embryonic lethals, and that's why uh, I, I suspect that it is the MAP two K five gene that's driving that particular phenotype. It, it could also be a combination of you know regulatory elements uh, for those all, all those genes because SMATs, of course, are very important for you know development and uh, important uh, growth factor pathways, uh, but it, 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 it could be a combination of those as well. I see. So this is not like a topic I'm extremely familiar with, but as far as I understand, those TAD boundaries are helping to separate uh, enhancers from the promoters in the next TAD boundary, right? So mm -hmm. uh, do you see any like case, like either in your studies or like in the literature that 
when you delete the third boundary, actually the expression level of like a gene in the next topologically associated domain is increasing because of that enhancer now is enhancing the promoter activity of the gene next door. Uh, so yeah, there are a few reports um, that show changes in, uh, you know, uh, there's upregulation of gene as uh, there's also studies in the limb uh, that have uh, been done to reflect that. Um, I would go ahead and say that it's, um, there are both kinds of uh, um, findings. I mean, one is that we see changes in the gene uh, expression upon deletion of the boundary, but there's also cases, um, I mean, uh, there was one um, shown by a group in the UK. Uh, this was done uh, in the vicinity, uh, in the TAD, in the vicinity of the sonic hedgehog gene, and they didn't see any uh, changes in transcription as well. So it's, it's both. You see both kinds of effects. So it could be like just locus specific nature of that. Is it studied like what causes that like digit malformation defects you were showing for F and A4? Like from that perspective, is it like increasing expression, decreasing expression? Do you know if it is now? Um, in the example that I showed in the beginning of my yeah. um, you know uh, talk. For that one, um, it's not, they're just uh, not just deleting the boundary or just a part of the uh, TAD. The issue is in that you cannot dissect out um, because they are also deleting, you know, part of the coding sequences. So it's very hard to say what uh, the gene, the expression changes are coming from. Okay, okay, I see. All right. I don't have more questions, but we have more questions questions in the chat box. Uh, Yuji Mishina asks, great talk, only some knockout showed developmental phenotypes. Is it due to the genes affected by the deletion or due to unique structure of each boundary? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so um, I, I would say, sorry, I can't see that. I'm trying to see the question. Uh, so uh, I would say that it could be both. Uh, some of those genes don't have early onset phenotypes, you know, um, and uh, it's it's possible that it is both. Sorry, I don't I don't see this question. Uh, no, so no, sorry. sorry, I I moved it to the answered part. <laughs> uh, so okay. basically, yeah. is it like because of the genes affected from the deletion or due to unique structure of each boundary, TAD boundary? That's the question. Like um, you see a phenotype or not? So. It, it could be because of the gene expression um, uh, also. And um, um, are the unique um, uh, you know, context of each of the boundaries? Because for the, each of those, we have not looked at what the chromatin state is, for example. So we can't really, uh, I think, answer that question based on the data that I have. Uh, next question is from Augusto Ortega Granillo. Interesting talk. Do you think maybe TAD function is more important in actively dividing tissues as opposed to post mitotic differentiated tissues? Oh, so this, um, um, so th there have been studies that have shown, you know, difference in the number of TADs. Uh, between early differentiation and early uh, late differentiation uh, stages. Um, but um, I, I don't think that the changes were like um, enough to say that the TAD function is more active uh, either in the early um, dividing tissues or, uh, you know, uh, post mitotic. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I will have one last question. Are there examples of TADs which are not evolutionarily, evolutionarily conserved? Do they play a role in evolution from Vesa Cartina? Yeah, definitely. So there are uh, some studies done in apes um, and other, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-human uh, primates, where they have shown that there is a very small percentage of uh, TADs that are very spe uh, specific to the lineage. But it's a small uh, portion. Uh, thank you. You have two more questions you can answer later on. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Salina Saved and Dr. Raj Darkar for your excellent talks. This seminar has been recorded and will be available on the STB website starting Monday. Please join us for next month and also next year's first seminar on Friday, January 14th, when Dr. Jennifer McKee from Duke University Medical Center and Dr. Frank McAbenta from California Institute of Technology will present. Thank you all for coming.